Thanks for joining us on Wellness Talk Radio. I'm Chris Costello, and today we're talking with Paul Williams, author of Gratitude and Trust, Six Affirmations That Will Change Your Life. It's uh, written with Tracy Jackson, and we are just so thrilled to have Paul on the show today. Paul, thanks for being here. No, thanks for having us, Chris. I appreciate it, Chris. So you lived in Santa Barbara for a while uh, here, uh, right next to Jonathan Winters and uh, Robert Mitchum. So that must have been you pretty know, I, interesting. I, I, you know, I had a couple of good buddies up there and all that. And moved up, moved to when my my wife became pregnant with my son, our first child. We decided that the Hollywood Hills, with you know, with no sidewalks and and cars flying around the corners of the hills, it was no place to to raise a family. So we headed up to Santa Barbara and to Montecito. It was idyllic. The only thing that wasn't idyllic about the entire situation is that daddy was a drunk. And, uh, and, uh, so the, you know, that, that fabulous life of, of, uh, of the, you know, the, with the acreage and the, the swimming pool and the, the beautiful clean air and the, the mountains and all was, was, was lacking in one thing, a responsible father and husband. Oh, now that that seems unfair to be in the dark years in Santa Barbara. You know, it's 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 kind of insane, isn't it, to go to you know, Santa Barbara and 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 hide out in your uh, in your bedroom or in your or in your office and all. But in fact, yeah, I I did, and you know, I had a home in in the Hollywood Hills at the same time, and I was always running off to that, and it was uh, it was a it was an interesting period of my life where where I was just. You know, the peak of, of my my career as a, as a, a songwriter and as a performer it was it was it was right at the top, but I was also at the, at the uh, the solid beginnings of of an addiction that was that was clearly getting out of control. Yeah, I mean you've had phenomenal success as a songwriter. You know, Johnny been on Johnny Carson thirty eight times, all those things that you know just amazing things. And what do you think happened? How do you you know, obviously at some point you went from maybe recreationally using these things to serious, serious addiction? You know, I think that, you know, first of all, we know that, that alcoholism is a, is a disease. The John Lake study proved that in the 60s, you know, that, that it, it is a disease and it's it's a, a progressive disease, a chronic and potentially a fatal disease. So I don't know when I crossed the line from use to abuse to addiction, but somewhere in the 80s, I, you know, the 70s were so productive for me and all, but I think that what is also really interesting is that in the midst of of, of my greatest success, it, it, I kept kept reaching for the bottle, kept reaching for the drugs, medicating some sort of a some kind of fear inside me that perhaps I just didn't didn't really belong. You know, you, you walk on that stage when you know when you win a major award like 1977 with the Oscar. You're standing there, and people always say, "What is it like to, to have that moment?" And that moment is where you're standing, and you're looking at a face full of iconic figures. There's Kirk Douglas, there's Burt Lancaster, there's Betty Davis, and the like. And I think on some place, there's some place deep inside me that was just kind of, "You don't belong here." And when they find out, you're going to be in terrible trouble. And that, and that's the food that I think I medicated. And that's a pretty common thing, too, from what I've read. Absolutely, I, I think it's, I think it's pretty common, and I, and I think that that. That for me, that this kind of sidestepping that feeling, using the alcohol and, and cocaine to to sidestep or to to camouflage, mask, you know, that that self doubt and fear. I think before I ch- I used alcohol, I, I think I I I just simply avoided the feeling. You know, I talked about talk about some of this in as we're, we're working on the book, talking about these things with Tracy. You know, I, I would you know kind of intellectualize them and then start start writing about some things that happened to me and. You know, when with when I was thirteen, my father was killed in a car wreck, and I was shipped off to live with an aunt and uncle. Actually, losing my entire family in that sense because I lost everything that was familiar to me. And I'm writing about it, kind of intellectualizing it. And, and the three words I kept hearing from Tracy were, "Go deeper, Paul. Go deeper. Get into this process. You know, what what does that feel like? What does it feel like to wake up in a stranger's bed like that?" And and uh, I think that the fact is that long again, long before I drank alcoholically. I acted alcoholically because in the midst of that, uh, in the midst of that really great sadness, I didn't feel it. I mean, I don't remember being sad as a kid. I was five years sober before I got to the point where I went, you know what? You had a Dickensian <laughs> tragic childhood. Why weren't you sad at the moment? Why weren't you scared at the moment? I had already mastered the art of sidestepping the, the, the true emotion. And our authentic life is, is at the true emotion. You process it and you fully live life. 
that's what we've tried to do with the book. What I think was successfully done it is, is created uh, the six affirmations, which can lead through a process to really deal with what you're feeling, whether it's fearful or, or celebratory, and move forward with your life. Yeah, and some of the thing, you know, some of it too, I mean, alcohol is uh, often very genetic, and your dad had, uh, you know, died from alcoholism, right? You know, my father died in a car wreck, an alcohol-related wreck. I had two brothers, uh, uh, both recovering alcoholics. There is a genetic propensity for the disease, and uh, I've always joked that I came from a long line of short, short drunks, but it's not really true because both my brother and my dad were six-footers and all. So, uh, but yeah, there is a, a definite genetic element, and and I think there's you know for so many alcoholics it, it begins you know as as Tracy points out you know a, a lot of the things we get in trouble with start out as great fun you know it's fun to drink it's fun to party it's fun to you know to to meet somebody and run off and and, uh, and rent a hotel room it's it's fun to you know to order that 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 big you know, triple banana split Sunday. But you know, at a certain point, uh, when when the when you wake up to the cravings, when you find yourself at a place where you're starting the day with a glass of vodka in the shower, uh, you're out of control with with an, an addiction. And I think that that the 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 fact is that that when it hits a hardcore addiction for an alcoholic or a drug addict, we know what to do. I mean, it's it's one of the gifts of of if there is a gift of of, of alcoholism is you know that your problem essentially begins with. You know that something needs to change, and it's probably me is that I need to stop drinking. So it's pretty clear what you know what my problem is at the beginnings of of, of uh, recovery that I need to get the substances out of my life and all. It's interesting the people that we've talked to that are in recovery, some and people incidentally in, in in radio as well, talking about their their life in advanced recovery. Reading the book, one of the lovely things we've heard from them is that. That as as they've read the book, they went. This is awakening things in me that I'm not doing that I should be doing. I want to go back through the book again and and use it as a workbook and and really begin the process of really really you know weeding out the behavior that is just unacceptable. And uh, that, that's a gift. That's a, a a lovely gift to hear from somebody who's got you know 20 years sobriety or 25 years sobriety that says. In this in this book, gratitude and trust is is the potential to make my life a little shinier. And, and it's interesting, Paul. That first affirmation, uh, you know, it, it begins with me. It's such a simple statement and seems obvious, but it's it's really quite striking when you read it and you think about it. Thank you. You know, the 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 exciting thing for me because for twenty four years, people have been saying to me, I, I, you know, why don't we have what you have? You guys in recovery. You go from just your lives being an absolute mess to to the heights of success. You're happy. You're honest. Why don't we have something like that? And I've dealt with that for like 24 years. And finally, when when Tracy said, you know, why not? Why not create something with when, when an entirely new voice based on those principles? And that that had to be where it began. We know something needs to change, and it's probably me. I think that one of the 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 things that that is is very smart about that first affirmation is that the word probably is stuck in there. And that probably is, is, is in, in this case, is, I think, is symptomatic of, of it's, it's there for, for that moment of willingness. You know, you try on this, something needs to change, and it's me. That's an absolute. Is this going to fit in my life? I don't know. But something needs to change, and it's probably me. Allows you the time to live with the thought, look at the information. You know, you create a list of what, you, you know, what you're doing in your life and, and begin to move forward in the process. And and that willingness is in that moment of waiting for it to actually be where I can discard the problem and go, yeah, something needs to change, and this time it's really me. Right, and thinking about what if it's not them? What what if it's not my circumstances? What what if it's how I'm thinking about it? Sure. You know? And the, the fact is that there there are cases where, where the, you're going to need to change when the problem is not you. Something something needs to change, and it's probably me. Is is you know, there's a, an entire section on called navigating the nasties, which uh, is uh, a, a section of the book of talking about where you're dealing with somebody that is just problematic in the relationship. It's a brother or, or a family member that is just you know, you go to that Thanksgiving dinner and you go through the same revolving door arguments every time that they will not let you up for something you supposedly did. And and you, you, the 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 confrontation and the the argument over the second helping of turkey is is predictable. It's a revolving door, and it's become the relationship. The language it's become the language of the relationship. 
But you take that first that first affirmation and say something needs to change, and it's probably me because Louis, the brother that that loves bringing this up again and again and again, probably isn't going to change. But you can change the way you relate to him. You can back away from that behavior and say, Louis, you know what? You're right. I was a little less attentive to other people's feelings at the time, and I'm sure that some of the things I did were probably very painful for you, and I'm sorry for that. And if Louis brings it up again, you say, yeah, Louis, you know, mom's painting. Isn't this fantastic? Look at mom's painting. So there's, it's something that it's kind of a one-size-fits-all entry, uh, uh, entryway into, into changing those parts of your life that are just, that, are, that just aren't fitting, that need to be improved. And so, Paul, how many years actually were you pretty much, you know, addicted to alcohol and drugs? I've always said that you know you're an alcoholic when you misplace a decade. That, you know, you know the '70s were incredibly productive for me. I had, you know, I, I had great success economically. I had, I, I, I was constantly on television. I became better at showing off than at showing up. If you put down a couch and a camera, I would plop down there. I loved the way it felt to have all that attention. I loved. I became totally addicted to the attention, and it, it was, it was. Uh, and I think the, the the expense of of my craft and of my art, I think that my songwriting suffered as my as my addiction to alcohol and and cocaine increased. It outran that addiction to attention because I could have sat in that. I could have you know tried to you know to hang on to that for another ten years. But one of the elements of of alcoholism, one of the one of the uh, you know one of the the, con, the one, part of the condition is is a tendency to isolate. We isolate within our disease, and so the. The alcoholism and the cocaine use had me hiding out. You can't hide out and do Johnny Carson at the same time, so all that had to go away. But my uh, my use was, by by the late 70s, uh, I was getting to the point where I could not really leave the house to go to work. I just, my day was consumed with you know, finding the dealer, making sure that I had my drugs for the day, and uh, getting somebody else to go take the meetings for me because I couldn't show up. I was lost, and and I, and if anybody had told me that I could go years without without drinking and using it, I would have left. I would have said, are you kidding? I can't go a day. I can't go a day. Can't be done. So were you actually writing during those years? Well, in the 80s, I wrote a lot of really bad songs that nobody recorded. I wrote, you know, I wrote, and I think the only thing that they got very much attention that I did during the 80s was, uh, was Ishtar. I wrote the intentionally bad songs from Ishtar, and, and while it makes a good joke that, well, you were in a great condition to write bad songs, they actually were songs I was proud of. They were believably bad. I like, but, but no, my productivity went out the window with, with my drug and alcohol use. And, and at that time, one of your friends actually tried to, or did confront you, and I wonder, what was that like? Chris Caswell who's my music director, has worked with me since 1977. It was one of the few people that had the, the courage to uh, to step up to the plate and say, you know what, I love you, I will worry about you. He didn't say I love you, he said I'm worried about you. Uh, this this deal with the, with the drugs is totally out of hand. Uh, I, I just had to say something, and I said, you're fired. You know, I fired him on the spot. I, I had others that worked with me and worked around me that were would actually bring drugs into the house. And, and uh, when, uh, when I was supposedly trying to quit, you know, I would have a few days together. I had a uh, uh, somebody that I worked with in management that, that brought drugs into my house and left them out for me to find, you know. So, uh, but Kaz tried to help and I fired him. Of course, one of the great things that you get to do when you get sober is you get to put your life, you, you get to make amends and, and uh, I will. I will learn from my mistakes and not defend them. And I, I will continue to, to. I will make right the wrongs uh, that I've done. Is, is one of our affirmations. And and in in recovery, it's a huge the amends process. And I love the word amends to mend what you have torn asunder. I was able to mend that relationship with Chris. And that is that is one of the big affirmations in gratitude and trust. And why is that? I think so difficult for a lot of people to do. To well, to own own our mistakes, I think that that a lot of it is 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 bad habit. A lot of it is just is that fear based thinking that if we show the world, the world who we really are, if I step up to you and I and I say, you know what, uh, yeah, that was absolutely my fault. I I was supposed to be there. I wasn't. Uh, I was a failure as a friend. I was a failure as a coworker. Whatever. Uh, there's that takes a certain courage that that I think comes. 
maybe just after a bit of a spiritual awakening. But the first, it's interesting because it's, it's a process that once you experience it, the relief for, you know, of, you know, it's you're pushing that old you know, Sisyphus rock up the hill and again and again and again, trying to defend your behavior when you know it's wrong is exhausting. And you're burning daylight while you're doing that. But the, with the first few experiences of turning to somebody and saying, you know, I, uh, I was thinking about what happened in that Lake Tahoe then, uh, that 4th of July, and uh, I totally lied to you about your car. I was the one. Nobody hit your car in the parking lot. I was drinking, and I bumped into the, 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 that damn park bench that somebody put there of all places on the sidewalk and own it and say what I did, and I'd like to make restitution for that right now. The, the, the relief that comes from a moment like that, is its own reward, and and you build on that, and you begin to find that as you as you make those amends, as you as you turn to the people that you've hurt, and and you and you 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 straighten those those moments of your life out, you become lighter, and you know you, you all of a sudden it, it's Tracy has a wonderful thing she talks about about you know like being emotional sherpas carrying all of our baggage around, you begin to cut loose some of that baggage, you become lighter, you have more time on your hands, you become more productive. And our capacity to, to then listen as opposed to constantly jabbering away, defending ourselves, we begin to grow and our lives become better. And we have fun. You know, the other thing is interesting. Tracy and I were talking this morning in the car that, you know, the, this, the, this entire process is also, I mean, I think that, w- that one of the things that, that we're hearing about the book is that people are talking about how funny parts of it are. There are, there are some rather, you know, rather st- outrageous moments that we, that we both share with the readers that, that uh, I think that there's there's a uh, there's a good time to be had while you know while you walk through this process. Had you thought? Had you ever envisioned that you'd be writing a book like this? You know, I fell in love with recovery as soon that you know when when I experienced what it was like to wake up instead of coming to. I loved it. I, I when I when I was suddenly you know the, the beginnings for me was just being honest. You know, I, I, my connection to people has always been my songs. And, and so it's always kind of one step removed. So there's a kind of an inherent loneliness or aloneness in that and uh, self-imposed, but, but it was there. When I, things got bad enough that I hit my knees and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm terrified. I think I'm dying. I don't know what to do. I need help. Will you help me? People came forward in droves of the, in the recovering community and said, you bet. We've been there. We know how that feels. We're there for you. And they, they, they reached out their hands and, and, and lifted me up. I absolutely, absolutely fell in love with the whole process. I went to UCLA. I got my certification as a as a drug and alcohol counselor. And I entered what I refer to as the Pauli Lama period of my life. That's where that's where Tracy gets to Pauli Lama, and uh, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was it was the most meaningful uh, uh, event of my life. That was, that was the rainbow connection for me. That was the connection of of suddenly feeling like I was part. Of the family of man. A lot of people really struggle with, they have a loved one that is really battling addiction. And it's such a painful thing to go through. You know, how do, like you said, you had your friend that confronted you way back when, and, and you responded by firing him. How do people that are close to someone that's struggling, uh, what, do they, what, what do they do? How do they cope? Well, there's a, there's a chapter in the book called The Ones We Love, you know, which deals with specifically dealing with somebody that, you're, that you love that is that is caught up in an, in an addiction of some sort. One of the first things that I tell people that always surprises them is that you have to take care of yourself. You know, the alcoholic, if it is an alcoholic, the alcoholic is is powerless over the alcohol. And as the friend, as the wife, as the as the mother, you you essentially are are powerful or powerless over the alcoholic. So if you if you're dealing with somebody that's a child, somebody that's in their teens and all. You have you have great power as far as, as legally what you what you can do, but at, at a certain point, at a certain point, if somebody is not willing to help themselves, then then you have to be to be willing to set down some really strong boundaries. Stop paying the rent. Stop covering for them. Start you know the, you know, the if you get up in the morning and the car is is more on the lawn than it is in the street, lying to the neighbors about what happened, calling the boss and saying Bill won't be in today. Yeah, he's got the flu. Yes, I know it's the third time he's had the flu, but but being courageous enough to reflect the truth back to the person that needs help, you know, and again, setting solid boundaries for yourself where you say, I, I, at this point, I can't have a relationship with you until you begin to do something about what's killing you. Because I love you too much to win. In, in, in my case, it was a young lady 
you know, be, before I finally hit that 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 bottom and and made a call for myself, the, my first exposure to the whole process was a young lady saying to me, "I love you too much to watch you die," so I'm leaving. So I tried to get sober for her. It didn't work, but it was my first exposure to 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 rehab, to to trying for a, a sober life. You give somebody a great gift when you refuse to lie about the condition that they're living their life in. You give somebody a great gift when you turn to them and say you're out of control, uh, and uh, and I can't be a part of that. I, I want you well. I want you happy. And these are the things I'm willing to do, and these are the things I'm not willing to do. And Paul, one of the affirmations uh, is you know you'll make. We were talking a little bit about you'll make right the wrongs uh, that that you've done or I've done. What most surprised you when you set out, when you started to do this? I think one of the the big surprises for me, the huge surprises for me was, was how, how loving people would would be right back to me when I, when I brought something up again and again, there was, there was a greater response to my having recognized the wrong that I'd done and trying to, to, to amend it than there was a a clinging to uh, any anger or resentment. I mean, there were people that, you know, that were like, you know, you'll run into people that will say, I don't want to hear it. There'll be people that, you know, that will say, you know what, I didn't like you then. I don't like you now. Take take a hike. That's, That's a possibility. I haven't experienced that. What I did experience was one interesting situation with a gentleman who I worked with uh, during my, my worst years on Ishtar for like a year and a half when I was just a mess. I missed meetings. I lied about where I was. I said I wasn't using when I was. It was I was a mess. And as he dropped me, we'd, we'd been in the recording studio, and as he was pulling up to my place and right before I got out of the car, I said, you know, I just want to say I was probably awful to work with on, on HR, and I, it must have been horrible for you, and I really apologize. I started to get out of the car. And he reached over and grabbed, kind of touched my arm, pulled me back in, grabbed the door and shut it and said, if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it. What I was doing with him that I would never do again is I was kind of, you know, doing a drive-by amends. I wasn't giving it the attention, the respect that something that is really kind of a holy moment deserves. You know, you're taking this moment where you're turning to another human being. You're showing them who you that you're aware of who you've been. It is unacceptable, and I'm willing to look at that with you now and try to set this right and all. So I, I've, I've, uh, I've had the, a couple moments like that in my life, but again, that relief of, of being able to, to, to look at the mistake, recognize it, own it, and, and make a proper amend, is, it's, it's, it, the, the value is, is almost beyond measurement uh, and instantaneously physical for me. Well, I find that when I make an amends, I get an almost immediate physical sense of, of release. I get lighter. I get I get silly. I, 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 get, I get oh my god! It feels so good to have that wrong. You know, it's like a little pain in the chest that you know that's gone. You know, that Pepto Bismol really did wonders. Just being able to to track down the person that I know that I owe the amends to. You know, and do it. You know, the the other thing that it, it this is something Tracy always points out is you do it the day the day that something like that happens. It won't keep you awake four months later, or four years later, or or a decade later. If on a daily basis I will continue to examine my behavior on a daily basis, you will find you know that that it, it, when my head hits the pillow at night, if there's something that I've done during that day and I can get to it immediately the next day, set it straight. Um, you know, my life continues to improve. And the way my life is right now, it's just its just beyond anything I could have imagined 24 years ago. Yeah, and you were recently awarded a, a Grammy for Album of the Year uh, for your collaboration with Daft Punk, a beautiful Isn't song. That amazing? It's, and I just turned 74, and, and to win Album of the Year, this was my third Grammy, but I'd never even been nominated for Album of the Year before. So this was it was, was an amazing gift, and... And the last two-year process of, of, you know, from that moment where, when Tracy turned to me and, and I said that my choo-choo runs on the twin rails of gratitude and trust, and she said, there's a book there, you know, and, and we began this journey of, of writing this book together. I have, I can't, I, I couldn't have imagined what this was going to feel like to, to have something where we're beginning to get the response where people are saying, you know what, what you've done is, is remarkably enjoyable to participate and to read and all. But more importantly, it's it's helping my life already, and that's that's you know the last one is I will live my life. The last affirmation is I will live my life in love and service. 
gratitude and trust, and and there is nothing that feels better than than doing the right thing. It's like you know, wellness radio. Let's have a moment with wellness radio. The concept of going to work on a daily on a daily basis at wellness radio and being able to give that to the rest of the world. You must feel you must have that same sense of, of love and service in what you're doing and the, and that sense of accomplishment. It's fantastic. Oh, I really appreciate that, Paul. And I'm, I'm kind of laughing because actually ever since I began this little quest, uh, everyone in my life has become ill. <laughs> so, oh, really? But I hope I'm reaching some, I hope I'm inspiring some others. Well, the thing is that what's great is that you're in a great position to help them out of it now, you see. You, you, you know, you you get to be a warrior for the light and lead them right back to health again. There you go. I hope so. But uh, I did want to say, too, that song uh, that you did get the Grammy uh, Award touch. It's just a beautiful song. Now, is that your voice on there? That is me. I'm singing. To, I wrote two. I wrote Beyond and Touch. And then I, they asked me to sing Touch. And it's you know, it's interesting because it's a song about, about I remember touch could very easily fit into to one of the elements of addiction that we're seeing. Well, that we're seeing, I have to cop to it, as, as I'm sure Tracy would tell you. I have a, a, a serious attachment to my iPhone that goes past healthy, and I know that and all. And I think that, that there's a, a personal connection that that uh, with all the social media that's going on, with kids with their constant tweeting and, and the like, and the, uh, the about four minutes worth of attention span that that uh, that people are giving each other, the touch is something that that uh, I think this this song kind of addresses that. That I remember touch, you know, feelings came with touch, you know, a painter in my mind. That that it's something that we have we're in danger of losing, and we need to address the things that separate us from our our authentic selves and the person that can really, really, really solidly feel an emotion and share it with another human being one-on-one. Yeah, and that's just, it's an incredibly moving song. And, oh, thank you. And I agree with you that, you know, I want to ask you, uh, in Gratitude and Trust, uh, you know, one of the great things about the book is uh, it isn't just a book for people that have had struggles with alcohol or addictions. It's it's for everybody. I mean, there's something to take away for everybody. And But I, I'm curious about, for you, what the most challenging affirmation was. The most challenging affirmation for me. And you're right, incidentally, just to go back to your, your statement, the original title of the book was Recovery is Not Just for Addicts. We, we wanted to write a book that would take the the concepts of recovery and the principles of recovery that had saved my life and so many lives and all. But really, voice them in, in a new voice for people that you know that that were not dealing with a life-threatening addiction, but with life-limiting habits and all. So that's exactly who they we're finding a, a large response from the recovering community. But the, our initial audience was one step removed. Was for that person that that perhaps was reluctant to step into into the full tilt world of recovery. That they had something that they didn't feel. Was you know the, they wanted to work on, but they didn't want to step step into a place where they would would pull pull on the mantle of addict. You know that that they had habits that were that were unproductive, that were that were interfering with their life, and and they wanted something to deal with it. So the affirmations become become a, a very kind of common language, easy way to move through these things and and to to you know set your life shiny side up. The most difficult. I don't think any of the of the the affirmations would be. I would describe as difficult. But I would say that that the one that that is probably the most powerful to me is is. Uh, I don't know how to do this, but something inside me does. It's it's something beyond my ex- ability to explain or put into words why why it is so powerful to me. Uh, it's something that I use all the time. I I have. You know, I walk on stage, and I've been doing this for years and years and decades and all, but before I walk on stage, I get nervous. I get scared. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, there's people out there. You know, you peek out, you know, you know, maybe a small audience of really nice people that have come there to, you know, to to love me. But someplace inside me kind of goes, whoa, and I, and I feel that thing rumbling in my tummy. And, and it's, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always said that it's just, it's the big amigo cleaning my windscreen, just getting me ready. But I walk out onto that stage and I feel absolutely at home. But to get from that place standing backstage and, and to, to a place where I can walk on that, that stage and be really glad to be there is, is that one affirmation. 
I don't know how to do this, but something inside me does. I don't know how to talk to Chris. I don't know how to do this, but I don't know how to do this. But something inside me does. And I think that it works for the, the, the big problems in life and in our lives, and, and, it, and it works for the little ones. And I think that that sense of having an inner ally, however you choose to describe him, I call him or her or it or whatever that energy is, I call my higher power the big amigo. I turn to the big amigo, and and, uh, and I immediately feel comforted. So that's that's the affirmation that is that is probably the one I use the most. You're listening to Wellness Talk Radio. I'm Chris Costello, and we're talking with Paul Williams and Tracy Jackson, authors of Gratitude and Trust, Six Affirmations That Will Change Your Life. So, Paul, uh, you know, I've just got to ask you also, you know, when you started out, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, but did you have any idea where you would go with your songwriting and, and the acclaim that you've you've had over your lifetime? No, it's funny. I was I was an out of work actor, and uh, again, no was a gift. I didn't get the I didn't get the career that I wanted, and what I got was was spectacular. Because when I when I failed as an actor, what I did was I took the the emotions of what that felt like and, and sat down with a little guitar and taught myself some chords and started writing and. It was like it was like a homecoming. I immediately I didn't think about the, the success. I didn't think about other people recording the songs. I know that that something happened though when I was able to to put down the words of what it, what I was feeling, what it felt like. Then you play it for a young lady, and she kind of tilts her head to the side and goes, "Wow!" And uh, and <laughs> that's a whole other level of excitement about the writing process. But I had no idea that you know. The, and and the, I've always said that if I was the only one who sang my songs. I'd be hot walking horses right now, but I had the most amazing voices singing my songs. And uh, this morning, Tracy and I ran into uh, George Benson, and, and uh, who had recorded one of my songs. And he just as we were, we were standing talking, he started singing "We've Only Just Begun." And I got to tell you, I, I've never sounded. <laughs> I've sung that song a, a million times, but I've never sung it with the absolute pure beauty of of George Benson singing it or or Karen Carpenter. Yeah, you're bringing back memories now. Paul, we just want to thank you so much for spending the time with us. And, and before we go, I'd like to ask you, if there's one thing that you really would like readers to take away from gratitude and trust, what what would that be? Well, that, that, that they are not alone, and whatever they're dealing with, that they're not alone, and that in this process of picking up this book, you know, that just, just opening that front the page, Consider that you're that you're actually entering into a process. You're entering into a journey. Leave you know, leave that that uh, the self criticism behind. Leave the the uh, the doubt about the process behind. Give yourself to it, and and uh, and you know, and let it surprise you. Let the process of of reading what we've written, and and re- reading you know the, this amazing gift that I've been given that we've now revoiced. Allow yourself to be surprised by, by what it brings you. You know, if if you sit there and, and judge, you know, if you're judging your distance to the shore, to the shore with every, with you know, as a, as a swimmer, and and you you know, you can't really enjoy the swim if you're measuring your distance to the to the shore all the time. So, give yourself to the swim. Dive in. Uh, read the book. Look at the process. Try it and uh, and enjoy the ride. You know, don't 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 judge. You know, see if you begin to, to sense a change in, in the way the way you feel about your your life and what parts of it you want to change, and uh, and hopefully you'll be level, happily surprised at who you are, and uh, and who you're going to be. And I know we only covered a few of the of the affirmations. So, uh, Paul and Tracy, where can people go uh, to find out more about gratitude and trust and uh, kind of get in touch? www.gratitudeandtrust.com. We also t- uh, is is our website. We also in- individually tweet. Tracy is at is at Tracy Jackson four. I am at I am the letter I the letter M Paul Williams. And we have our own uh, Twitter handle for Gratitude and Trust, which is at Gratitude Trust. But um, check out the site, GratitudeandTrust.com. I am Paul Williams, at Tracy Jackson 4, and at Gratitude Trust. Find out where we're, where we're going, where, where we're going to be, what we're doing, and uh, become part of the Gratitude and Trust family. We really appreciate you taking the time with us. 
Uh, well, we we are just so thrilled that you guys could uh, be on the program today. And I hope you start a Facebook group because there's a lot of things I want to try, but I have no idea how there, to do. Yeah, I, you, you remind me that there is, in fact, a Facebook. There is the Gratitude and Trust Facebook page as well, so enjoy that. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, thanks again, Paul. My great pleasure. Thank you.